<laughs> All right. Um, welcome, everyone. This is Embedded Systems, um, ECECS 5780 and 6780. So from this, you can already see it's a complicated class. We have four different classes in one, right? So it's computer science, it's electrical engineering, it's computer engineering, actually, and it's undergrads and grad student classes. So you probably have signed up for one of these classes, and that also introduced a little bit of a confusion with all the lab sections. Some of them only had four slots open. That was mostly because since we have four, like, four different sections, we have three di different labs, there were like 12 different lab sessions that people could choose from. And unfortunately, the online system is not like liberal enough that you can say, okay, for Monday, over all these sections, we can have 18 people. But it was like four people for this section, four people for that section. And for example, for CS6780, not that many people actually signed up. So many of their lab sections are actually open. So we will talk about the labs in a, in a little bit. But don't fret if you didn't get into the section that you really wanted to get in. We can see and you can try out to go that day to the lab and hopefully there will be still a spot open for you. So we have a total of nine stations downstairs. The labs will be done in teams of two. So we can support up to 18 people per session. Now, I also want to remind you we have one TA per lab session. So if there are 18 people in the lab, you probably won't get as much time with a TA as if there are only six, right? So it's up to you to figure out what balance that works. We just wanted to schedule this and have it in there in the calendar so we get a little bit of an idea um, how much and where you would fit in and what you want to do. All right. Another indicator of the number ECECS means embedded systems is really a thing that's <coughs> across the whole section of, on one hand, computer science, on the other hand, pure electrical engineering. It's really like a cross-cutting theme that you will see during the whole um, class. You will have to have some CS knowledge. You will have to have some EE knowledge to understand really the stuff in detail. So if you work in teams, it's a good idea to team up with somebody from a different section because they probably have a different background and a different idea. All right. So what is an embedded system? Why did you take this class? What will we study in this class? Quickly form like teams of two or three with your neighbors. Look at how many embedded systems or count how many embedded systems you wear on you or in your backpacks right now. Let's do it for two minutes. Go. Just count how many. Discuss which ones are embedded systems, which ones are not embedded systems. All right, let's see who wins. We have five down here. Who has more? Five. What numbers do you guys have? Four, three, Zero. one. Zero? Wow. No cell phone? <laughs> All right, did you hear that? Make sure it's an embedded system, not just little computers. So what really is an embedded system? Yes. System on chips. Well, let's see. System on chips. Sock. What else do you guys have? What else do you guys count as embedded systems? Wi-Fi adapter? Yeah. Like a USB Wi-Fi adapter? Um, just like the chip that handles like all Wi-Fi and radiations and all that signal. Wi-Fi chip. You could have a wireless <coughs> mouse. Mouse? Wireless mouse? What else? I think it's got to have some I.O. Some I.O.? Let's see. Some I.O. Uh, 
What else did you guys count? Cell phones? Did you guys count cell phones? Yes? What else? Your key? Anything else? RFID card. RFID card. Good one. Let's see. Because then probably everybody of you carries one of them. Anybody has one of these guys here? Like a Fitbit? Tracking your movement, counter that counts how many steps you're taking? Not yet. <laughs> Just wait till the government gets it. That's right. <laughs> Anything else? Is this an embedded system? My remote here to go forward and backward? Probably. So if you had five, what were they? Mostly phones and calculator. Phone calculator, there we go. All right, so Enix said you have to make sure that it's not just a little computer. What's your take on cell phones then? No. No? They're not an embedded system. They're not an embedded system? They're a little computer. Well, well, modern sure. cell phones. I would modern agree. Cell phones. I would agree. If, you've got a, well, if you've got a cell phone that has a T9 input, then that, I guess, you can count. It's like, <laughs> I wouldn't necessarily consider a lot cell phone that's like old being an embedded system like the automobile is an embedded system, but it certainly contains embedded systems. It so certainly it contains embedded systems. Very good. So then, what is an embedded system? Well, can we say an embedded system is not a general purpose system, right? General purpose systems, my computer here is the general purpose system. You get the computer, you load up your software, and you do with it whatever you want. <coughs> embedded systems usually have one single specific purpose, right? So he said a cell phone contains a lot of different embedded systems. That's absolutely correct. For example, the baseband processor in your cell phone is most likely just doing the baseband processing of your cell signals. It's, a general, it's not a general purpose system. It doesn't do the video graphics, for example. It's there for the communication. You have the Wi-Fi chip. It's actually a really good one. Modern Wi-Fi chips are little embedded systems. They have small little microcontrollers in them. They have controllers in them that can run code and do stuff with it. System on chip. Is that an embedded system? Exactly. You can make it into an embedded system. System on chip is more of a name for a chip that has a lot of different parts inside of it. Actually, the microcontroller we will study in this class is a system on chip. It has an FPGA in it, it's a microcontroller in it, and a lot of different peripherals, so it becomes a system on chip. What else do we have? Wireless mouse. Embedded system? Sure. RFID cards. Hmm. Is that an embedded system? What do you guys think? Who says yes? Two, three, four, five, six. No? The rest? Yes? Who is no? It depends on the RFID. About the same number? <laughs> yes. It depends a lot on the RFID chip. If it's just a really dumb little RFID chip, like the ones that you have on clothing these days and stuff like that, they are not embedded systems. All they have in them is a little bit of logic that just replies an ID back. But there are smarter RFID tags out there, especially active RFID tags, for example. They have logic in them. They have smartness in them. They actually do calculation and math inside of them so that they can do a lot more than just telling you a little ID. For example, some of them have flash memory in them that you can write into them with your RFID cards. And you can read that back out again. The key of RFIDs is that usually they don't have a battery. So you send them energy to run and do their execution. And then they will reply with a very short message back. So they have a very specific purpose. So yes, you can count them as embedded system. All right. So then now comes the next question. How do we build embedded systems? And this just reminds me. Um, I have 10 slides, if you guys want them. Unfortunately, um, the printer went out of ink, and we didn't have any ink anymore anywhere in the department. Um, the EC department is really struggling right now with a lot of different things that, that are going on. So. Um, I have 10 of them. The slides are online, too, right now on the website. If you want, you can download them, and there are many people with computers that can look at them. So if 
Somebody wants <coughs> slides? No? So the question is, how do we build embedded systems? Right? You go to a store and buy them, right? Usually. That's how it goes. No, not really. Somebody has to actually make them. And in this class, you will also learn how to make embedded systems. Actually, your homework number one, will you will make an embedded system from scratch. So how does it work? Well, we have several different parts that you have to do before you actually get your embedded system that does something specific. You have the concept. You have to select parts to fulfill this concept. You make your printed circuit board. That's usually the screen board that's inside a computer. You get that printed circuit board manufactured at a manufacturing house. And then at the end, you take your chips that you selected here, up there, and put them back together. You solder them together and power it up and hope that there is no magic smoke coming out of it. And that's actually exactly the steps we were to go through, right? So first, the concept. You think about an embedded system. What should it do? What should your system do? What's the specific purpose you're building this for? So for example, it could be as simple as blinking some LEDs at half a hertz. Or maybe it has a button there that you can turn the blinking light on and off. Very dumb, specific purpose, but if you want, you can push this into bigger things. You can say, well, I want to read a temperature sensor with my device and then have like a LED bar graph that indicates me the temperature right now. Or it could be a lot more complicated if you want to really go there. It doesn't have to be complicated for his homework number one. It can really be as simple as blinking an LED. I'm absolutely happy with it. The goal of this homework number one is to go through the steps that at the end you made your own embedded system. So first, second part is you have to select parts. So now you know what you want to do. Then you have to find a part that actually can do what you want to do. Octoparts is just one of these websites. There are a lot of other part as websites out there. Once you find a, found a part, you can go to one of these websites and find where you can actually purchase these parts. Most of the time, this will be DigiKey or Mouser. These are two gigantic distributors which have pretty much anything on the planet that you can get. But sometimes, some parts are a little bit more elusive and you have to go and search and hunt for them. Next step, schematics. So once you selected the parts, you have to make a schematic. Maybe you have seen them before. They look something like this, right? Where Every box here describes a certain part. You hook them up to each other. You draw lines and wires all just in schematics. You give them names. And electrically, if you think about it this way, it should work in your head. Or maybe you can actually simulate it sometimes. If you build these schematics correctly, you can actually start simulating these devices like that. And the simulator will tell you, yes, this LED down here will actually start blinking or not. Next, we have to make a printed circuit board. So right now, you just have the schematics that you look at as an engineer and you know what's going on, what's where, how it's hooked up to each other. But now you have to make this into a physical manifestation. That's the printed circuit board. This is what a printed circuit board looks like before it has been made. So this is basically taking the schematics you have seen before, put it into the printed circuit board editor, and then start laying it out, making the traces from different parts to each other, putting the capacitors to where you really have them and want to have them, putting the connectors to where they make sense, putting the LEDs in a nice row and not just like straight them all over the place or have them in a circle around it or however you want to align them for your physical design. Once you have this in your um, print PCB editor, you go to the next step. Now you have to actually get this thing manufactured. There are lots of steps out there and lots of websites out there that show you how to do that at home with a lot of nasty chemicals where you put them through a photo processing and then you put them into chemicals to etch the, the copper away and then you, out comes your PCB. And of course, there are big fabs that do this stuff for you, right? This is a probably a picture from somewhere in China which you can see the boards here. They are huge panels. They're like panels about that big where they manufacture and etch them at once. 
um, it usually stinks really badly in these um, manufacturing houses because of all the chemicals that are all around. And if you're lucky, we will actually have an excursion later on in the semester and go and look at one of the PCB fab houses that's locally here. Um, it's actually the one that we are using in this homework number one. So they offered us that we can go there and they will explain us everything in detail on how it works and what they do. Next step, manufacturing. So you will do all hand assembly, right? Like you take the parts, put them on your board, take a soldering iron and put them together. Of course, that's not how our embedded systems are made these days anymore, right? Like you have robots that assemble these boards for you. What you can see here is a PCB in the middle that got fed in from here on the side. You have here a lot of the different parts that are sitting there on reels and wheels. There's a robot arm that comes, picks the part up, punches on this like little thingy here to advance it, picks the part up and places it on top of the PCB. And it does this with very, very fast and efficient capacities. So some of these robots can place up to 80,000 components per hour. Well, that's, if you ever go to one of these trade shows, you can see these big Siemens machines with their flying heads that they just come, they make it just like moves all over the place. And it's, it's quite fascinating to actually watch. Um, so they, that's exactly how our iPhones, our cell phones, our Android phones, HTC phones, whatever, these PCs are made, right? They go and fed into one of these machines, with high precision, the robot comes, assembles them, and then after that, they go through an oven, get heated up, soldered together, and out comes your running PCB. Hopefully. Yes? Uh, just wondering, with all the parts that are going on, especially the smaller resistors and things, yeah. wouldn't you want to do a little spot soldering to begin with, just to make sure they don't fly off as the board moves around the plant? Good point. So, paste or there is solder paste. So instead of putting solder on or just putting the parts on top of it, I actually left a step out in here. And that's the screen printing. What happens is there is solder paste that gets put on top of each and every pad. And solder paste is basically liquid solder that has resin in it and solder, two solder is together. It gets put on there and then the parts get actually put on to top of the solder paste. And the solder paste is actually good enough to hold the parts in place without any problem. So there's enough friction and contact surfaces that they just stay there. Now, of course, if you have two layers, it's a whole different story. Because you put the parts on one side, right? If you put them through the oven, great, that will work. But how do you now put stuff on the bottom of your PCB, right? And they actually do that at the same time. And how they do it is with glue. So they first put a little bit of glue down and then put the parts on top of it so the glue will keep them. Then they flip these boards around and stuff the second side and then shove them through the oven that way. So that's how it works. So sometimes they put glue on also for bigger chips, like if, if it doesn't work, isn't, is, is, if it's too much, you can put a dollar of glue down before you put the, dot, the, the part on. Make sense? All right, so, and what is homework number one? I call it lab zero, homework number one, because it's, it's very hands-on actually what you have to do. Well, it's an introduction into PCB design, really. So you have to um, check out Canvas, we use Canvas for all assignments, all grading, all the lab reports that you have to submit, so we use Canvas. If you're not signed up for the class, let me know and I can add you as a student into the class. You can go through all the different things um, that you want to do. Also, make note that there is um, the discussion forums. Um, I have several students that will monitor them, so if you have questions, post them on there so that other people can actually see them, and I have students that will monitor them and that will reply to your questions. So it's a four-part homework. It's going over four weeks, so every part is about one week. In the first, um, you will choose and select your parts that you want to use. Um, and we will use a schematic editor called Altium Designer. It's a professional um, schematic PCB editing tool that's installed in all of the computers on the digital lab, analog lab, and the classroom that's down there in, on the third, second floor. So it's available on all these machines. If you really want to have it on your own laptop, um, come and talk to me. You can install it, and I just have to create an account for you. But if you are here on campus, it's in the labs where you can use it. The second part will be um, layout of the PCB. So the first time, the first week actually due already on Thursday will be the schematics and selecting of the parts. Um, it's due so short because over the weekend I will correct your schematics and make sure that tell you what you have to change because next week we will actually go into the PCB editing phase. So we, it's really a short turnaround time. So you have to really start working on this. Second week, layout and PCB. So you will make the PCB design. 
Third week, um, we will submit these boards to a manufacturer that's local here in Salt Lake City. And then the fourth week, we will assemble these boards and we'll upload a little bit of code and hopefully see some blinking LEDs that are around. Unfortunately, I couldn't really organize it that we can somehow take and put the charge off these PCB manufacturing into the class charges or anything. So you do have to pay for it yourself. It's really not much. I think it's about, how much does circuit graphics charge? 350 so 350 per square inch. What the board you will make is probably like one and a half, maybe at most two square inches. So it's about like $8. Um, at the same time, you will get something physically back that you can assemble and you actually see the process of how this has been made. Same for some parts. So the more expensive parts you will want to put on this board, the more expensive your board will become. I don't expect it to be more than five to ten dollars at most. Three twenty-five. Three twenty-five. Per square inch. Okay, so about seven dollars in total for the part uh, for the PCB, and then another ten dollars for parts. Um, if you're smart, you group your orders together with multiple people, so you save on shipping. Um, so make groups and get your parts together. Uh, what else? Altium installed, we have that. Oh, and there is a nice little walkthrough of the homework, which will be probably very helpful. If you have never done any kind of schematic or PCB editing, I actually went through the whole homework one, especially step number one and two. Um, the link is on here, you can go and get it. Uh, you can look at it, it's a YouTube video about one and a half hours long, um, where I go step and step through the video. It's a little bit of a quick video. Um, I shot it all in one run without a script next to it. So sometimes I'm hunting for a couple of options, so bear with the video, but it explains you everything you need to do for your homework number one. All right, any questions so far? Yes? Not unless you break something. <laughs> Does that make sense? Um, so the rest of the hardware, we have the, the, the designs. There's no, no uh, not the designs, the, the PCBs we will be using for the actual class. Um, they are provided to you for the rest of the semester. As long as you don't maliciously fry them or are just stupid with them, there's no extra cost. Um, there might be some cost associated with the project that you do later on. So the second part of the whole class is a project. Depending on what you want to do there, um, you might have to purchase parts for yourself. Yes. We do have a lot of parts already available, but if you want to do something exquisite and special, there might be costs associated with that. But that's under your control, depending on how much you really want to do. And not absolutely, like if you, if you want to do a software project, that's absolutely available too and possible too. So, yes? Can we uh, use different uh, CAD software than Altium, or do you have to be Altium? Come and talk to me. Okay. I would prefer if you use Altium, you don't have to. Yeah. I mean, the, what would you want to use? What is it? Dip trace. Dip trace? Yeah, sure. It's, uh, free to use if if you want to use dip trace, you can go for it. You can also use KiCad or Eagle or anything else. Um, I just can't give help. Like the only uh, the two tools I know is Eagle and Altium. So if you use dip trace, you're on your own. I can check your schematics, of course. I mean, I can look at them and see does this make sense. I will look at your PCB and your gurus. Um, but you are a little bit on your own on how to get there. I'm pretty comfortable with dip trace. Then go for it. Sure. Any other questions? Uh, two layers. <coughs> yes. All right. Now comes the question, why the heck are you studying this course? Right? Why would you invest so much time? Because this is a really, it's a heavy workload course. It's four credit hours. It has a lab associated with it, and that's not it. There's homework to it, and the labs take more than the lab hours. It's kind of quite a lot of time you actually will spend in this. But I hope it will be a lot of fun. And actually, you will learn a lot about embedded systems, a lot about microcontrollers. And hopefully, coming out of this class, you know why all of this is really important. OK, so why embedded systems? Well, embedded systems are really everywhere, right? Modern cars have multiple embedded systems together in one car itself, with a lot of different distributed systems. Flight controllers, airplanes, getting more and more embedded. We have measurement tools, a test equipment, a lot of embedded systems in them. Medical devices. A lot of these medical devices are embedded systems. They are special purpose systems. Cell phones, of course. Embedded really becomes to be everywhere, right? And this is just the big part that we see here. Embedded systems become smaller. There are tons of embedded systems in your cell phones, smartphones, iPods, 
Well, they even go into toilets these days, right? <laughs> I mean, we have the Fitbits, what I showed you before, and there are now 10, 20 different companies coming up with these measurement tools that you can measure how fit you are, how much you walk around. There are even tools now coming out that measure your heart rate, your EKG signals to see if your heart is actually okay. All at a very cheap and small cost, low power. We have watches, right? This is the TI watch, there's the Pebble watch that was on Kickstarter. We have glasses that become embedded systems now, with the Google glasses. They're really pushing hard on this. And, of course, all these iPods, music devices that we carry around. Well, this space, I guess it's more and more iPhones and phones themselves. So let's just highlight one of these embedded systems, and that's the Fitbit. So this is the, the old version, um, the old generation, the new generation I showed you just a second ago. It's like this tiny little thing here, right? It has almost nothing to it. It has one button, has two little contacts back here for charging, and has an OLED display to show you what's going on. Battery life of an astounding eight to 10 days, if you don't do anything. It's really cool. Has a wireless system inside of it. It actually synchronizes over a Bluetooth link with your phone or your computer that has a little dongle inside of them, right? A very well-engineered embedded system. And this is not the only one. There are more and more of these things coming out. Some of them are wrist straps that are sitting on your wrist because they need skin contact to measure stuff. Um, a very interesting device that's certainly not going to stop at this point. This will become bigger and bigger. Another example is this one here. This is the um, Zio Sleep Manager. So this is a wristband that you put on while you sleep and it tracks how you sleep. It tells you how deep you sleep. Or if you have a toddler or a child, it tells you how often you woke up at night. You can probably count that yourself, but it's actually really interesting. We have done that with the Fitbits, and yeah, my wife certainly sleeps much less than I do. Um, another one, what vision? Also an interesting project, power, right? Like a lot of sustainability projects, they want to monitor how do we use power? Where does the power go? This is just one example where you put a little sensor on your meter, and there's a little blinking light that tells you how many kilowatts that you're using, and if you actually monitor the speed of this blinking light, you can find out how much power your whole house uses. This was a project where they made one of these pickup sensors, a station that shows you, plus a phone application that tells you how much power you use per day or per month or where the power goes. So what is really driving this um, embedded everywhere explosion? Quick teams of two, discuss it with your neighbors and see what we find out. You can also be teams of three if you want to. <laughs> All right, let's hear from over here. What did you guys find out? Yes. More and more of that system. I don't think so, no. It's, a, it's an interesting idea, but I don't think so. It depends on what you define as a general purpose processor, right? Yes, you can run Windows or Linux on pretty much anything these days. So then it becomes a general purpose system. But I think the key is really the embedded way of where the stuff is going. Up here? Did you guys find out? Yeah. Cheaper and easier. Very good point. Cell phones we are having today are so much cheaper. I mean, a couple of years ago, you would have paid thousands of dollars to get something like this. And now what, $200, $100? What else? What were you thinking? You couldn't discuss it with anybody, but. Most of it's getting cheaper. Cheaper? People don't have to have a good reason to use it now. It's just cheap enough they can just do it for free. Yeah. Good one. It's also the size of it. They could have made that yeah. Fitbit thing in the 80s, but it wouldn't be practical to have Exactly. It would have been a backpack that you were walking around. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Definitely size. 
we are trying to, to connect everything. Uh, mm -hmm. Like uh, my watch, the, the, the smallest watch, watch uh, it's communicated with my cell phone. Like, yeah. My very good point. It becomes very easy to use, right? Like, you don't have to go and read a display on everywhere. You just like log on to a website and get all the statistics. Yes? Um, another thing that uh, pops out is that it's getting a lot easier to develop these management systems. Because yeah. All you have to do is assemble them. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Ease. It won't be in this class, though, I'm sorry to tell you that. We will really look at the, the lowest level of embedded systems so that you actually understand what these other tools are doing. Right? Like that's usually the key point. Yes, you can go and use processing for your Arduino, but what's really happening at the bottom behind it, that's actually what we're going to learn in this class. One more. Uh, multiple processes in a single plastic package. Multiple so processes in a single plastic Gally package. Gallium arsenide, IBM standard CMOS in the same piece of plastic. Yeah. So that's an EE speaking here, as you can hear. <laughs> it's a lot of different processes, like exactly what we had up there, system on chips, right? You have a lot of different systems that you can bulk into one little thing now. Did you want to say something else? Or no? Was something back here? No? So and I, I guess we can sum all of this up in technology trends, right? Stuff gets faster, smaller, easier to use. Technology is advancing, and that's where all this embedded everywhere comes from. So one of the things um, that was... A, um, I'm sorry, <laughs> a little bit confused. Bell's Law. Who has heard of Bell's Law? Well, it stands right there, right? So, yes, what is it? Uh, yeah? Is Bell's Law, yes. Is that the idea that uh, the cost of things will have as they get more and more powerful over time? That's Moore's Law. Almost. But yeah, Bell's Law is. Every decade, there is a new computing class that's coming up. It's all kind of interlinked, right? Like it's linked with Moore's law, which says that process or transistors double every, I forgot how many years. Every two years. Is it every two years? So that's kind of like linked to it, right? So after 10 years, you're so much further ahead with your technology that there really is something new that's coming out, right? So. Back in the 50s and 60s, a computer was about the size of a whole floor of a building. Later on, it became like a single room that was one big computer. It became smaller. It was almost your personal computer that you could have in your office. And then it really became your personal computer, right? That everybody had one, had one on his desk. It became smaller, it became even smaller. Laptops came up, then PDAs, and then small little things things that we call in sensor networks moats that are about the size of a quarter. So the technology trend really became from huge and big, smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, <coughs> with about the same computing power, actually. Like the computing power you had up here in this big computer is about the same that we have today in this dime-sized thing. Right? <coughs> we even go further. We make this even smaller. And it's going to become even smaller. So some of the research I'm working on and uh, we are actually building cubic millimeter sensor networking nodes that can communicate, they can take pictures, they have data storage, they have a battery, they have a solar power, a solar energy that it can harvest. Uh, the size of a cubic millimeter, that's smaller than a corn of rice. There's another split off that actually happened earlier on, right? About in this time here where we had workstations and mini computers, supercomputers came out. Anybody knows what this is? CEs are not allowed to answer because I asked this before. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody? Do you guys not recognize this computer? Yes, it's a crate. They were huge. They don't exist really anymore. They got bought up and yeah. And then data centers. He used today as storage, as big crunchers. And they really work together with these small little devices, right? What you can do today is you collect a lot of information on your phones, on your sensors, shove it off into the cloud, which is really nothing else than a, super, a data center with a lot of smart algorithms behind it, which lives in one of these big data centers. They crunch the numbers, you go to a website and get the information back. And it's really, the change that happens here is from number crunching data storage to productivity, your computers, you still probably have one if you do some special purpose um, graphics and stuff like that, you still use a computer to what we call streaming information to or from the physical world. So stuff really becomes physical these days. Fitbits, I'm carrying it. I'm trying to monitor my physical activity, right? 
you try to monitor something, some physical behavior, some physical, um, some physical <coughs> phenomena that happens. This is the other law that we had, Moore's law, which is kind of like the other side of it, where we have the transistors that back in 1970, we had the uh, 4004 from Intel and then went up and up and up to titanium, and that's only data to like 2003 and 4, but this just kept going. Similar stuff happens with flash memory. If you remember just a couple of years ago, having a iPod with just four gigabytes of a hard drive in it was crazy expensive and amazing. These days, if somebody has four gigabytes of flash memory in his phone, you're laughing at them and say, okay, why didn't you get the eight or the 16 or the 32 or the 64 gigabyte version, right? So it really becomes cheaper and cheaper and cheaper to make this flash storage and storage itself is really important. Um, a lot of devices, cell phones, developed that way. Um, we have similar things happening with DRAM. DRAM prices are getting lower and lower. You have more and more memory in your machines for basically the same amount of money. And the last one is that DRAM is actually becoming so cheap that it's becoming a spot market. The DRAM price changes every day depending on availability, manufacturing, and about a year ago when we had this huge flood in, um, was it? Ch not Japan. That was bad too. Um, the, the earthquakes, but the floods in Taiwan um, was almost not talked about unless you were really interested in hard drives, but hard, drives, hard drive prices went skyrocketing again because a lot of big hard drive manufacturers have manufacturing capabilities there. They were all flooded. They couldn't produce any hard drives anymore, so they become expensive. Similar thing happens with what they call um, Hendy's Law, pixels per dollar becomes cheaper and cheaper. Cameras today with like 24 gigapixel, uh, megapixels. Um, our, my cell phone has eight megapixels. I mean, it's incredible. I, I remember my first digital camera had three megapixels and was like a big clunker like this. So it's, it becomes cheaper and cheaper to have really good sensors that have a lot of capabilities. Um, another example, MEMS accelerometers. So the thing that makes your, when you turn your screen, that flips your screen around, making sure that what tells you what points down, they are becoming cheaper and better. So we had um, on the order of milliamps back in the day going over to 25 microamps while even sampling at 25 hertz. So imagine you sample this thing at 25 hertz, it draws only 25 microamps, that's almost nothing. And this goes on and on to like 10 microamps at 10 hertz at six bits. And this is only gonna co continue, right? This is how these Fitbits work. They have a little accelerometer, they measure the acceleration all the time, they measure the step and they can have a battery duration of seven to 10 days because the sensors now draw almost no energy. Um, similar things, these guys are used in um, airbags. Uh, we have computers, hard drives have now accelerometers of course in them so that if you let your computer drop, they have a zero G detection, they park the, the head on the hard drive and if it uh, hits the ground, nothing happens to your hard drive. Um, what is this picture? Oh, oh cell phones. Awesome. That's it. It was a little dark on my screen over here. Similar thing, also accelerometers. What we now have gyroscopes. We have ultra low power gyroscopes, MEMS gyroscopes that have small little tiny things in here. They become smaller and they become lower power, but still have extremely good sensitivity if you actually turn them around. Energy harvesting is the other great thing that's actually happening. Now, we start to get to a point where our, our cost of our, uh, the energy draw of our embedded system becomes so low that we can actually use solar powers, uh, solar cells over here, the solar cell. We have electro harvesters, we have these ratcheting mechanisms that um, where watch, watches them um, were harvesting your movement of your wrist, for example. But back then we could only have a little coil. These days we could probably use this to power a microcontroller without any problems anymore. So energy harvesting, starts to become so good and so efficient and the electronics so good that now you can basically almost live from the energy that surrounds you. So let's look at Bell's Law again, um, a little bit on a dis different perspective. Um, back in 1971, we had the Intel 4004, 108 kilohertz, had 2,300 um, transistors, manufactured at 10 micrometers. In 2006, we had one of the quad-core Intel microcontrollers, had 2.6 gigahertz speed, had 582 million transistors, 
and was manufactured at 65 nanometers, right? So this is really the scaling up that happened. Faster, smaller, <coughs> more energy. These things draw a couple of tens of watts, probably like 70 to 100 watts, just burning on this little chip. The other way, um, the University of Michigan Phoenix processor was also made in 2008, had 106 kilohertz, so very comparable, had 92 transistors, so more transistors, mostly because it was manufactured at a smaller um, size. But what the key here is that it's a 15 times size reduction, 40 times more transistors, at a 50 times smaller manufacturing process. The key really is it's about the same speed, but it's a lot smaller, but has more capabilities. And it draws significantly less power. So with all of this information, now we come to the next step. What are the design questions that you're actually having to answer? Right? And one of these things that you really have to learn is that learning happens when assumptions are challenged and invalidated. Right? So let's look one example, cell phones. If you remember 2000, 2005, cell phones were the things that everybody had. You made phone calls with it, but the rest usually happened on a computer. Now, technology advanced, and some people were smart enough to think, well, hey, why don't we add a music iTunes in there? Why don't we have some MP3, MP3 capabilities? Why don't we have our calendars in these phones? And the key was really that more and more people started to use cell phones, right? So in 2000, we had about, what is that, 125 million people out of 250. So about half of the population had cell phones. I'm pretty sure today almost everybody has a cell phone except kids. And even kids start to have cell phones. And um, what can they do with these cell phones? Well, before we only take phone calls, these days we really listen to music. We do um, AM, FM receiving out here in the US much, but in, the, in Europe that's actually a big one. TV viewing, also not here in the US, but in Japan, they actually do have TVs and they can receive TV signals with their cell phones. Um, news and sports, you use probably your RSS, RSS feeds, um, you text a lot, you read emails, you write emails. You do pretty much everything with your phone. And if you think about it, your phone actually has become a more personal, personal computer than the personal computer ever was, right? Your phone is never leaving you. You're always walking around with it. So that's really an assumption that has been challenged and has been invalidated. No, phones are not here just for, cell phone, uh, for phone calls. We can do a lot more with them. Where did, yeah? Good question. I do not know. It's <laughs> a very good question. I do not know. So now everybody has cell phones. Does anybody know what happens when you press the power button on your phone? Both. Sleeps. Okay, but what, what really happens behind it? How does the phone know to go to sleep now? Voltage drops or rises, but then what? What, does, what happens with this thing? Processed. Processed, okay. Start going into a low power state usually. Okay. Or else bringing everything out of that. And does that processor do? Who does that? Power manager chip. Yeah, it's safe. Right? It Phones depends. are really complicated, actually, if you look at them. It really depends. It really depends. Can handle themselves and others can't, so you have to have somebody else tell them to shut down. Exactly. So many higher power processors, they are not very good at sleeping. So you have another processor that's really good at sleeping, turning the other guy to turn off or just shuts it off and turns off its power so it can't do anything anymore. And when somebody hits the power button again, it turns it back on, right? So stuff like that happens. And that's what um, uh, power... Monitor, uh, power monitoring chip is doing. And cell phones are really getting complicated if you look at it. Like what's actually going in there is kind of crazy. You have um, power conditioning switches, many different power rails that have to be adjusted and made sure that they come up in the right order after a power up. You have radio chips, the digital baseband, um, you have LEDs, you have external stuff like GPS, um, you have Bluetooth devices, the battery itself that it has to make sure that it doesn't run out of energy and making sure that it's not too low or else you will never ever be able to use it again. They are getting really complicated. So that's why we're actually not studying 
cell phones. They are very complex devices. What we will study is a 32-bit microcontroller, though. So the reason why 32-bit <coughs> microcontrollers, and actually in addition, a little FPGA, is the following. 32-bit is really becoming the mainstream. Everybody starts using 32-bit because the chips are getting small and lower power. ARM is really pushing this trend further, and we are using an ARM Cortex-M3 with a FPGA all on one system. So why should we study the ARM architecture? And more specifically, why the Cortex-M3, which is the particular type of ARM architecture that we are using. There's also an ARM chip in these guys here, right? But again, they are fairly complicated beasts, more general purpose, cell phone oriented. The Cortex-M3 is really the one that's driving the embedded everywhere, actually also in the Cortex-M0, which is the even smaller one. Um, they are getting used everywhere. Many companies are actually making chips with these Cortex-M3s. And the nice part of studying this particular core is that you can after that go to a company like Atmel or Dust Networks or NXP, TI, ST, Amber, Cypress, Microsemi. They all have chips which have a Cortex-M3 in them. The nice part is you now know its architecture. You know how the bus system works. Yes, they do differ in a certain thing, but not in the core itself, not in the compiler that you're actually using. So then, in what defer them? How do these companies differentiate themselves? Right? Just proprietary. Proprietary. But what is proprietary? The core is open. What peripherals. Sorry? Peripherals. Yes. Peripherals, peripherals, peripherals. And that's where all these chips defer. They have all the same core. It's all the Cortex and ARM Cortex M3 core. They run about at the same speed. They draw probably significantly different amounts of power depending on what technology they are using. But the big difference in all these chips is peripherals. So if you look at a picture like this here, and we will see such pictures a lot in this class, up here that's the core. That's the thing that's actually doing the calculations and the math. That's what's executing your code that you're writing. Everything around here, everything else is peripherals. And that's what changes from company to company. And that's how you go and select the microcontroller. So you can now search for a Cortex-M3 core and then see, okay, I need a I2S, I need five spy buses, three serial cores. Let me see if I can find a manufacturer that has a Cortex-M3 core that provides me these kind of type of peripherals. So let's look at a quick example. Um, this is a <coughs> embedded system that I actually designed during my postdoc. Um, it's how to make a phone into an EKG system. And it's a good example for an embedded system. And I will show you for what reasons. So this is the whole device. It's about that big. Um, it's called the Hijack system. And it's run by a MSP430. So that's a Texas Instrument MSP430. Um, it's a different architecture, which we won't directly study in this class. But in actually the platform or the PCB in homework one that you're designing, you will be using an MSP430 because they're really easy to use. Or they're small packages, they don't have many pins, and they're very easy to hook up. So that's why we chose an MSP430 for that. We have some circuitry on there, but really not that much. And most of this part over here is for power harvesting from your headset port. So you have a microcontroller, you have something that generates your power, and then you have a headset port, and you use that headset port for communication, which basically pretty much makes an embedded system. You have an EKG system now that was plugged on top of it, that was monitoring and taking the, the EKG leads and your heart rhythm. The MSP430 was actually measuring these signals and transmitting it over the, the bus that we have over here, over the headset port, basically using audio signals. It was just doing beeping up and down and modulating the signals so you could actually get it through the headset port. An application over here was decoding all of this and showing you the data. So really, this has all the elements in it that an embedded system has these days. Communication, power, and some math data input. Um, this is another view of the whole system. So it was one inch by one inch. It's a fairly small little thing that can do all of this. All right. Um, how much more longer? Ooh, almost done. No, that clock is completely wrong. All right. I have 30 more minutes, is that right? Ish? Okay, cool. So, course administrativa. Um, the boring part is over, this is more the important part now. Um, we have two TAs. We have An Luang over there. 
set up. So he will be the TA that's usually in the labs. Um, and we have Qian, is it right? Um, Lin, she will be also in the lab probably sometimes, but she will especially do um, correction of your homeworks and correcting your lab reports. I think that's the, the way we will do it. There are a whole bunch of other people um, from my group that will help you guys out with um, the later parts of the project and also during the homeworks. If you have questions, they will answer your forum. So if you see people um, like that are called Andres Sesh, he's one of our students, and um, John Davies, he's another one of the students that will answer your questions. And I'm not sure if I haven't added Kyung Min over there, he's another one of my students um, over there. He, I will probably add him too because he took the class last year too and probably can help you guys out with many of the questions you can um, answer. Office hours is uh, Tuesday 2 to 3 p.m., so right after class, 20 minutes after. Today, I have to cut it short at 2.30 because I have a phone call um, that I have to do at 2.30. So if you come in today, please come at 2 o'clock so we can answer the questions. Um, but else, every other day will be 2 to 3 p.m. on Tuesday. Um, prerequisites for the class, CSEC 3700, Digital Systems, or 3810, Computer Organization. This course is mainly because you have to have a little bit of background of memory, pipelining, you should know what digital systems are and hopefully know a little bit of what a Verilog is. The other prerequisite is a computer programming, so either CS2000, CS1410, or CS4400, mainly because you should have a background in C programming, if possible. If you know Java, you probably will have a hard time in this class unless you're really quick in picking up programming languages, because what we are programming in is MC, assembly, and very log for the FPGA part. Graduate students, I don't think there is any prerequisites. You just have to be enrolled in the class. Um, we assume you pick up whatever you don't know quickly enough. Um, it's part of grad school. So I don't think there are any prerequisites for the class itself. Course syllabus, um, still tentative. It's a little bit in flux still, but you can find the course website. We'll always have the latest information. We are using um, Canvas. For assignments, you have to hand in assignments on Canvas. We use the discussion forum on there, and the grade will come from Canvas because it's since this is a complex class with all the different <coughs> parts that we have, it makes it a lot easier for me instead of having to go to four different websites and do all kinds of craziness. Um, class is organized in about 50% labs and 50% project. So we have a total of seven different labs in the beginning eight weeks, no, more beginning 10 weeks. And then the last part is just a big project where you will be building groups, and we'll talk about that in a second. So what are the labs about? We have schematics and PCB design, so lab zero this week that starts. Next week, where the official labs start, we have FPGA and hardware tools, microcontrollers and softwares is the next one, memory and memory map I.O., interrupts, timers and counters, serial bus interfacing, and data converters. These are the things we will be doing in the lab, and hopefully this will prepare you enough for the project that you're doing later on, where you will use all of this to make some amazing embedded system. The labs themselves start next week, so when you go into the labs and actually do stuff there, and the TAs will be available um, next week. They are tutorials most of the time, familiarizing you with the tools we are using to program our embedded system. They should all be fun. I hope at least they are fun. We try to make them fun. Um, you will learn how to sense, you will learn how to control physical world, um, you will build hardware itself in home homework number zero, or lab homework number one, lab zero, sorry. Um, so you will do something with them. They should be instructive. You will hopefully come out of this class by really knowing Verilog. You will really know C programming and how it actually gets put into assembly, how to read assembly and opcodes. You will learn how to debug these embedded systems. So with a physical JTAG debugger, um, you will figure out how stuff really works down there in the nitty gritty details and you will learn how to interface peripherals to your computer. So how to interface external <coughs> sensors, motors, and stuff like that, and how to control these things. At the same time, the labs are challenging and they are time consuming. I do know that. I went through all these labs multiple times myself, so plan ahead. If you already have a very busy schedule, this might not be the semester to take this class because it does take a lot of time. Organization, we have three sessions in the digital lab it's a MEB 2265. Session one is on Monday, session two Wednesday, session three on Friday. Um, the key here is 
I don't really care to which session you're going, as long as there are not too many people. As I said before, we have nine workstations that are available. I want to, you guys to work in teams of two. And if you work in teams of two, so there are 18 spaces there. Again, if the lab is full, I'm pretty sure the TA has to run around a lot and will be busy with many people, so you won't get as much time of him than when you go in a session where there's less people. At the same time, the digital lab, I think, is open 24-7, so there's really no need for the TAs unless you get stuck, and you can do these labs whenever you want them to do. Try to have mixed teams. Um, if you are a CS, I highly suggest to go with a CE or an EE. If you are an EE, I highly suggest to go with a CS or a CE, because they just have a lot and very good understanding of the other side um, of the scale. Uh, you have to have a CAID account. If you don't have one yet, please go and make one. You need a CAID account to log into the computers down in the digital lab. And there is a local printer that has a 400 page limit, which is this semester for the first time enforced. The key is it's an additional 400 pages. So it's different from the CAID 400 page limit. This is a different 400 page limit, so you get an additional 400 page, and if you run out of it, you can purchase another 400 pages through the digital labs there. So it's actually kind of a nice policy. And they had to introduce it because there were people really abusing it and printing like booklets and thousands of pages on the printer, so that's how it goes. Lab. Um, we cover them in the next week. I will talk about the hardware. You will check out the hardware in MEB 1381. Um, it's one micro semi smart fusion. That's the microcontroller we are using a breakout board two USB cables And I think the radio that we will use for one of the labs and um, will also be already in there You will keep it for the semester at no cost unless you break it So please try to be careful with these <coughs> devices Be careful not to short the board some of these small little pins that are coming up some of them are power the other ones are ground Don't hook them up together. Don't put your leads on both of them and um, bad things happen and they break Use anti-static mats in the lab. The lab has some um, anti-static mats, so if you are in the lab downstairs, first of all, always quickly touch the ground so you, you're not electrostatically charged, and then use one of these mats um, to work on. Also, put the hardware back into um, the little anti-static bags that they're coming in. It really helps with the hardware uh, in not trying to fry and break them. I do know, I understand, stuff happens, stuff breaks. Um, that's expected, but just try to be careful. The second part, which is, I think, the more exciting part of this class, is the open-ended project. And the goal is really that you learn how to build an embedded system, well, by building it, right? You come up with an idea that you work in teams, you come up with this idea and try to build this within about six weeks. So by the end of this quarter, you have an embedded system that does something. Um, I will show you guys a couple of examples later on. And there is a lot of, and later on we will talk about the specifics about projects more and where you can get more ideas, but we will build a small little embedded system that does something hopefully very cool. Um, it should possibly be related to the class, so try to use an ARM Cortex-M3 microcontroller, but it's not necessary that you, have, that you do it. If you have a good reason for not, that's okay. Um, it, the scope has, of the project has to grow with the size of the team, so if you have a I expect a bigger project from three people than from two people. If you're four people, it becomes a really big project. So talk to me if you have an idea and if you want to get this up and running. I also encourage you um, to have a mixed team. You get more interesting projects out of it if you are a CS and an EE, because an EE can do other things that the CS person cannot do. So projects really become more interesting. Just a little um, look at last year's project. So we had some really cool projects. We had, for example, a pet pipe. I should have actually brought it with me because it's a small little pipe that you turn it on and you just roll it away and the, it slows slowly down and later on it just rolls back to where you actually launched it from. Very tiny little project but it's still it's a, it's a very impressive uh, integration of the whole th system that they did and I, I make sure I will actually bring this and when we talk about projects again. Um, we had smart facilities, somebody built a 3D LED cube, uh, we had a Wi-Fi embedded sniffer and encryptor. Uh, we had a Christmas sweater, so somebody made a sweater with LEDs on it that were blinking around. It was kind of fun. And I just want to highlight one of the projects. This is the Audio Digital Effects and Recording System because um, they really blew me away with what they actually finally um, finished. So this was their whole system that they actually built up. Now, they didn't do all of this in the project, and I don't expect you to do all of this. Basically, this is um, Paymon Saibis and Philip Moses' project. Paymon built this part here. Um, for his computer engineering 
um, senior project, which was basically an analog um, audio effects generator for guitars. And the project was to make it bigger and actually add a digital component to it. So what they did is they added this small little thingy up here, which is, as you can see, is not a Cortex-M3 based system, but in their case it really made sense. So this is a Texas Instrument DSP based um, system, so this is a digital signal processor, which of course if you work with audio, a DSP makes a lot of sense to use and not a Cortex-M3. And what you can do, what he did with this whole system is he interfaced the system with his digital effects generator and added digital effects on the DSP that were actually then able to distort your signal and by a push of a button and basically recreated what guitarists have on their own uh, small little pedals. Um, exams, we have two midterms. One of them is in the big, um, around February 28th. The other one um, to be determined in the date, but it wouldn't be the later part of the semester. First one will be emphasizing on problem solving fundamentals. So what we actually do now in the lecture and the second one will then be um, a bigger part of the whole project, uh, of the whole class itself. There will be minute quizzes that I do in the beginning of the class. They are one minute quizzes, basically one small question on a topic that I covered the week before, or not the, the, the lecture before. They are random, so they are a random coin toss, and if it's heads or tails, depending on what we decide, we will take it or we won't take it. Um, you can... I forgot what the policy is, I think it's on the website, but you can, I think there is two of them you don't have to attend, or two of them, the two worst ones will be dropped and the other ones count, something like that. I forgot what the exact policy is. Um, but they are random, so you don't really know when they are coming. Um, grading, labs 28%, projects 30%, exams 22%, quizzes 10%, homework 10%. So you can see it's, it's really not like a course that's just homework, it's really 30, 30, and then this is another 30% themselves. So the project counts a lot. Don't ignore the component of the project. So do the labs. But the labs are over a longer time, so the project actually has almost most of the weight. And if you want to go to grad school, um, here's just some advice that I have been given and I want to give to you guys too. Um, grad school ap um, applications require letters of support. Now, faculties write these letters in kind of like a coded language. Right? If you want a really good letter, you must have impressed a person, and he will write you a very good letter. And letters actually matter a lot to get, especially into the very good schools. So if you are interested in going to grad school, impress me with a project that's really outstanding. Maybe work on it during the summer or the fall semester, and I'm sure you're going to get a good letter of support out of it. And the last part, this demo of the audio processor, I just wanted to show you, oops, one requirement of the project itself is that you make a video that we will post and look at, and I need to quickly set this up here, see if we can get audio out of this thing. Hmm. This one doesn't work. Oh. Nope. <laughs> All right, that doesn't work. Too bad. Um, if you want, go and look at this video. It's basically Paymon playing his guitar and his synthesizer effects, or you can come and look at it here. It's it's really fun, and they did a really good job from a song from a um, Swedish metal band named Tiamat. This is the main solo of the song. And this will be played with our oh, own that. analog distortion and our own digital delay, and I hope you guys enjoy it. So, all these effects were done in this type of thing with the DSP. They were all digitally done. They were really careful that they made this all happen in real time. Um, which is actually some of the hardest things that we've probably had to do. It's one of the things that you learn to do in a better system. Things that can work on it. It's not easy. It's very easy to record something and post process it, but if you're doing something on the fly, it's quite a thing.
if you want, you can watch the rest of it by yourself. All right, any questions?